Hi everyone, good morning. My name's Jen with Slope Garden Center. Welcome to our fifth webinar in our virtual series. We welcome back Suzanne Bontempo with Our Water, Our World, talking about fertilizing basics. This is super important information to get ready for your gardening season this year. Um, we did have a link on the reminder email that you received an hour before the class that links you to her uh, resource handouts and outline. So you all should have that. Um, and if you can take a moment to fill out the poll and the uh, follow-up survey, again, we're trying to get as much information as possible to make the classes more enjoyable for you. We're gonna do a different format for this class. Um, and a lot of it is based on your feedback. We're gonna do a, a shorter class and we're, uh, Suzanne will be talking for about a half an hour um, with no break for questions and we'll reserve all the questions to the end. So hopefully a lot of your questions will be addressed during the presentation, but if not, then we'll take time at the end to um, address them and you can drop your questions into the Q&A portion and we'll go through them at the end. Um, the recordings for all the webinars should be available by Monday evening or definitely by Tuesday morning following the class. So all the recordings are available on our Slope Garden Center's website under our seminar and workshop tab up at the top. And they've been super resourceful so far. What's nice about the recordings is you can sort of fast forward or, or rewind or whatever and go back over information multiple times. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, next week, I'll actually be teaching a class. So that'll be different. Um, uh, and I'll be doing indoor plant basics. So if you haven't signed up for that, uh, definitely check out our website and you can register for that class too. Um, all right, Suzanne, I'm so happy to have you back and I look forward to all the information that you're about to share. Thanks, Jen. Thanks everyone for joining. It's really nice to be here and boy, it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day. So let's get going. So welcome. I just want to start by sharing that there are no gardening mistakes, only experiments. So please keep that in mind when we're out there in the gardens, uh, you know, planting new things or trying new techniques that uh, it's, it's just a lot of learning and a lot of fun. So as Jen mentioned, our agenda for today is I'm going to go through slides for about 30 minutes um, and then we'll leave time for questions afterwards. And what we're going to learn uh, this morning is why we need to use fertilizers, what are fertilizers, which fertilizers are best and how to apply them. So before we get into that, I just want to share that as the program uh, manager for Our Water, Our World, I just like to give Our Water, Our World um, a little shout out or explain who we are if you're not familiar with them. Uh, we've been in a partnership with Sloats for decades, uh, as well as a lot of other retailers around the Greater Bay Area. We are a national award winning program. We teach integrated pest management education. So that is where I'm coming from. And we partner with local water pollution prevention agencies and retail businesses to promote less toxic pest problem solving and healthy gardening. So integrated pest management quickly, I'll share is a decision making process that uses science based strategies. Okay, it allows us to look at the system as a whole, be it our house or our garden, and it helps us identify what the problem is. And then from there we decide, is it a problem that we can live with or is it a problem that we actually need to address? If we need to take some action, then we use a combination of different types of actions. Uh, those would be cultural controls, bolstering the health of the environment, mechanical controls, the tools we use to manage pest problems, biological controls, the living organisms to manage pests, or chemical controls, which are the pesticides. We always use these as a last resort and we always use the least toxic possible. We can also consider just removing the plant if the plant has always been a problem or hasn't thrived. Give yourself permission just to remove that plant. But today we're going to talk about 
bolstering the health of our environment, cultural controls, because when we increase the health of the garden, we reduce pest problems substantially. So why do we need to fertilize? So this is the nature that surrounds us. Being here in the Greater Bay Area, we're surrounded by uh, beautiful bay forests, redwood forests, and rolling hills of coastal live oak uh, pastures. And each of these are unique with their, uh, the soil biology, uh, the, uh, the community that's within the soil and the relationship with the plant. As these leaves drop, they create leaf litter. That leaf litter will decompose and feed the microorganisms that are specific to that plant community. And then in turn feed that plant the roots of that plant, the special unique nutrients that are designed specifically for that plant. The microbiology and the soil communities are a combination of uh, beneficial bacteria, beneficial fungi, beneficial nematodes, protozoa, things like that. Some of you may have heard the term soil food web. This is um, um, a little, little snippet of what I'm getting at is that we want to enhance the biology in the soil because when we have a nice diversity of biology, we are able to feed the plants um, uh, uh, in a more natural way. These, uh, the biology, the microbiology in the soil is actually, I like to you know, um, think of it as the uh, nutrient transport enhancement system. It breaks down organic matter, they store nutrients in the soil, they break down toxins and pollutants, and they hold the soil together. They're very, very important. And so these are the gardens that we create, much different than the ones that we see when we're on a hike around the Bay Area. Beautiful ornamental gardens or food gardens. And when we create those gardens, we are amending the soil with compost. But is compost enough? Or I should say, I sure hope you're amending your soil with compost because that's really going to be uh, very important to help the uh, root systems start to establish themselves. So how do we know what our soil needs? Um, really, we should be testing our soil. So it's really important to test our soil because that's really going to be the only way we can identify what the soil needs, what it's lacking, what it maybe has too much of and so forth. Um, these are a couple uh, soil testing labs around the Bay Area. But you can always just do a, a search on the internet and find one that might work best for you. And then pH is something else I just want to mention. Uh, pH is also going to be important when we're talking about how we fertilize because if the pH is a little too basic or a little too acidic, I'm sorry, uh, alkaline, uh, basic or acidic, yeah, I had it right the first time, uh, then the nutrients freeze up and are, are not always available. So if we have a pH that's too low, too acidic, or if we have a pH that's too high, like over seven and you know very basic or very alkaline, it could uh, lock certain nutrients up and make them not available to the plants. So the best range is going to be uh, pretty much in that neutral zone from six to seven. And acid loving plants are going to like things uh, a little bit lower between five and about 5.5. So what are fertilizers? Well, there's a whole lot of different types of fertilizers we can buy when we go to the store. The shelves are just full of different types of bottles and jars and um, packages of different types of fertilizers. So um, there's a lot to choose from. And so I invite you to take the time and read the label. The label is going to give us a lot of information. First of all, straight out the gate, you're going to see these three letters NPK. They stand, stand for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the label is also going to have other information like what are the ingredients and what is the application rate and um, what are the best types of plants that this fertilizer might be for. Or is it an all-purpose, which will work for all the plants? The NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, are the micro, I'm sorry, macronutrients. Macronutrients are also sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. 
Nitrogen is going to be the uh, green growth, what we see green leafy growth. The phosphorus is going to help produce healthy roots and blooms. And the potassium is going to promote all around well being. However, uh, what I like to think about is um, like nitrogen is going to be the green growth and then the potassium and the phosphorus kind of go a little bit hand in hand when we want to have uh, uh, higher yields with our vegetables or more flowers on our blooming plants. And then there's going to be a whole list of uh, micronutrients such as iron, zinc, copper, manganese, boron, and a few more that are also going to be equally as important. But uh, typically when we're looking at a bag, we're seeing the NPK numbers and that's what's kind of driving the direction that we go when we make a decision. So which fertilizer is best? So on the shelf, we see there's a lot of choices um, and we can look at the benefits between organic versus synthetic. Which one is best for us? We see that both of these are going to be tomato and vegetable foods. We see um, they have a lot of similarities on the bag or on the box. Um, they both look like they're going to feed our food crops. Uh, but we see a couple of different um, things that you know, the numbers might be slightly different. Um, the ingredients are going to be slightly different. So we want to have a little bit more of an understanding what is really the difference. And what I'd like to share is that organic fertilizer is going to feed that soil my microbiology. It's going to support that, uh, that relationship between the soil the soil, the living soil and the plant root structure. It's also going to increase the overall health of the soil. It's going to prevent growing spurts. And what I mean by that is when we apply fertilizer, uh, if, it's going, if it's a fast release similar to synthetic, we're gonna get a lot of new growth that's stimulated. And what happens is, is insects, like that tender new growth and are um, more prone to nibble on it. So when we're working with organics, we're preventing those growth spurts. We're going to have a slower growing habit. So that we're less likely to see pests attack that plant. Sustain, uh, organic fertilizers are also a more sustainable food for the plants. It's going to be feeding them more slowly. It's going to be offering the nutrients such as the nitrogen, the potassium, the phosphorus and the potassium at a more uh, natural rate. So it really can absorb those nutrients with ease. Uh, organic fertilizers will not run off into our local waterways. Um, they won't burn the plant. So in case you accidentally overdo it, you won't have to be afraid that you, you there's no risk of burning your plants. It's more economical because we're not fertilizing as often. And it uh, comes from natural materials, uh, from plants or animals. And it's also renewable and or a byproduct. Synthetic fertilizers are going to only feed the plant and you will need to uh, reapply according to the directions. So, because it's dependent on that, for, that plant is dependent on the fertilizer. So if you miss uh, a couple of weeks of fertilizing, that plant is, is not able to uh, be fed. It starts to get stressed out. Also, as I mentioned, the synthetic fertilizer stimulates a lot of new growth, with the, which attracts insects. It's going to invite those pests. Um, synthetic fertilizers are high in salts, which we know are quite detrimental to the soils over time. Um, it can, the synthetic fertilizers can contaminate the waterways. It can burn the plants if we apply too much. And it's a manufactured uh, products extracted by a chemical industrial process. So right there, I'm going to share that I am going to favor the organic fertilizers. So. And I um, invite you to start to use organic fertilizers. If you haven't, you'll start to see that your plants are going to thrive and grow much better. So here's a illustration of what I'm speaking about. So organic fertilizers 
will break down. Uh, they'll go into the soil and the soil biology will decompose and process those that food and then have their symbiotic relationships with the root systems of the plant and provide that plant with what it needs. When we work with organics, we have a tendency to see the pH be appropriate for that plant. And we also see that um, there is a nice balanced um, uh, amount of those uh, macronutrients, the NPK seems to be very balanced when we're applying the organic fertilizers, the plant is able to get what it needs. The chemical fertilizers, the synthetic fertilizers, as I mentioned, are just strictly feeding the plant roots. So we have to be very uh, precise about what we're giving that plant, what that plant needs, which is a little more challenging. And there's a lot of room for error when we're working on that level. Then we have uh, some choices. We have, we'll see fertilizers that are single ingredients or blended ingredients. So the blended ingredients will be a combination of uh, things such as alfalfa meal, cottonseed meal, fish meal, bone meal, blood meal, all of these words that, can, um, that we'll see on the side of the box. Whereas then there's a single ingredient, just back guano. And you can decide what is best for you. Or we have a granular fertilizer that looks like ground up like oatmeal versus uh, spikes. Sometimes the fertilizer spikes are going to be the best and easiest. Uh, they have a tendency to be a little bit more expensive, but they're very convenient to use. And we don't have to um, maybe fuss with the dry fertilizer as often, I'm not sure. You can decide every situation is going to be unique. So you can see what might be best for you. And then we have a combination uh, or choice between liquid or dry. So liquid fertilizers like the fish emulsion, fish hydrolysate, seaweed, kelp, there's combinations of liquid fertilizers that have more ingredients. Uh, the liquid fertilizers, when we apply them, the plants are able to absorb those nutrients a lot faster. So if there is a plant that seems like it's uh, stressed or just needs a little bit of vigor, applying a, for a liquid fertilizer uh, will be really a benefit because that plant can absorb those nutrients very quickly. I like to equate it to us dr uh, drinking like a green juice. Our body feels very stimulated. We're able to digest that, uh, that juice, the nutrients from that uh, very quickly versus a dry fertilizer, which will take time for that biology to decompose it, to break it down and make the food accessible. And then some terms that we uh, may see, we might see terms such as the CDFA, a uh, little logo or the OMRI listed for organic use badge on the products. These are certified organic. Uh, this could be important to you or not. And I will share one more thing. Uh, these logos, these badges are very expensive for the companies to uh, obtain. Uh, it takes a couple of years uh, of a process of meeting the criteria and showing that they meet the criteria year after year. And then they pay a pretty hefty uh, fee to be a part of uh, this registration. So if you feel that the product is clean and organic, or has the ingredients you're looking for, I would encourage you to use it or do a little bit of research, even go to the, uh, the company's website or give them a call and ask them questions. Uh, I work with a lot of these, uh, the fertilizer manufacturers and they're all really, really nice. They all want to help you. They wanna help support you and they want to clarify any questions you might have. So just know, just because you don't see these labels on here doesn't mean that the product isn't good or isn't going to be of the highest quality. Okay, what are the best ways to feed the plants? So this is an image I use a lot when I talk about watering, but we're going to, it, it works for, uh, it's very relevant for fertilizing also. We want to focus the fertilizer around the drip line of the plant. And the drip line of the plant is that the outer edge of that canopy or the outer edge of the branching structure of that plant. It could be a perennial, it could be a lettuce, it could be a tree, a shrub, it could be a rose, 
but it's going to be this outer edge. And the reason why is because when the roots are growing out, and hopefully we're encouraging them to grow out by the way we water, we have these little root hairs. And the root hairs are the ones that are able to uh, access the nutrients. That's where that beautiful rhizosome is where all the action is happening. So we wanna focus the fertilizer out there. We do not wanna focus it around the trunk or the crown of the plant. And so this is a really great picture when we're talking about uh, fertilizing fruit trees a couple weeks ago. I still think this is very relevant, regardless, again, if it's a perennial, a rose, a fruit tree, whatever you have, you can adjust it accordingly. But what we have here is around the drip line of the fruit tree, we have uh, put some fertilizer, a little uh, compost on top, and then we've top dressed with some straw using it as mulch. It's not around the crown of the plant, but it's out around the outer ring of the root system. And we can scratch dry fertilizer in. If we're not using spikes, we can scratch it in. We're going to uh, move any mulch out of the way that might be there. And we'll just kind of slightly scratch the fertilizer in, integrating it into the top inch or so of soil. And then we can put the mulch back on top of that to protect that soil and to protect that um, uh, fertilizer. We don't need to go very deep and we also want to be mindful not to disturb the plant roots too much. Now we can disturb them a little bit, you know, uh, giving those root hairs a little trim is okay, but we don't want to do too much disturbance. And then we can also apply liquid fertilizers as a soil drench in our watering can, applying it directly to the soil or as a foliar spray where we are applying it to the leaves of the plant. And again, the leaves also can take the nutrients in very quickly. A couple of things I will share is that we don't ever want to spray foliar spray when there's going to be um, a frost or significant heat within 24 hours. It's always best to apply the foliar spray, uh, the fertilizer, as during the cool part of the day. And you probably want to check, just do a little test first. I have full disclosure, killed a very mature Daphne for a client by applying a foliar spray. Daphnes are fussy. They don't like a lot of fertilizer. This was when in my early years of gardening, we learned by our mistakes and I did have to replace um, this beautiful established Daphne. So just be careful and uh, just test before you start to um, do a foliar spray of established shrubs. And then uh, on top of everything else, literally on top of everything else, we want to make sure we're always protecting our soil with mulch. Always finish with a nice layer of mulch. Mulch can be wood chips or straw. It is going to protect the soil. Uh, a lot of times, um, especially if we're working with um, well, the dry fertilizers, you know, they can blow away if we haven't worked them in really well. Um, it just, let's get a nice layer of mulch on top just to protect the soil. And as that mulch breaks down, it's also feeding the soil. It reduces water evaporation and it creates habitat for our beneficial insects. It's just a really nice thing to kind of finish with. So this is why we fertilize. So we can have these beautiful gardens and grow an abundance of food. And a few tips that I can share is that annual food crops, such as our um, the vegetables we grow, not the perennial vegetables, but you know, like our lettuces, our tomatoes, our zucchinis, the broccolis, all of that kale chard, they like to be fed regularly. So when we plant vegetables, we're going to, um, I like to, uh, I've amended the soil with some compost. I will put a little fertilizer in the planting hole at time of planting. And then as the plants grow, I am doing a soil drench of liquid fertilizer about every week to every other week. Because when I'm growing food, food needs a lot of nutrients and a lot of energy to produce the food that I wanna eat. So I wanna make sure I'm feeding it really good quality food so that I can enjoy really good quality food. Roses, I can share, love alfalfa meal. 
So when I do my rose pruning, uh, which was probably around right now, if you haven't already, but typically the beginning of February is end of January, beginning of February is when we do our rose pruning, right? But it's not too late if you haven't gotten to it. I, after I prune my roses um, and I've applied a dormant spray, if that's what they needed, then I'm going to fertilize and I'll get a good um, rose fertilizer on the bag. It'll say rose and flower. That one's perfect. But I'll also get alfalfa meal, one of those single ingredients. And though alfalfa meal is going to be in my rose and flower fertilizer, I want a little bit more. And I'll do equal parts and I will fertilize my roses with the rose fertilizer and the alfalfa meal. I'll put a nice layer of mulch on top. And then through the growing season, which usually starts around the end of April, beginning of May is when we start to get our first, you know, show of flowers. I will uh, apply a soil drench of a nice liquid fertilizer like that fish and kelp that we saw really about twice a month. And the reason why is because I want beautiful canes, I want beautiful buds, and I want the flowers to continue to go through the season. And when you practice this fertilizing um, strategy, you're gonna see a remarkable uh, show of flowers all the way into October. Okay, containers. When we're planting in containers, we need to feed more often. So this could be a combination between those spikes or adding dry fertilizer if you can um, get it in between the plants. You know, sometimes the plants end up getting really large and we can't really access the soil anymore. But if you can, get a little dry fertilizer in there, put a little mulch on top if you can. But more importantly, if you can't get any dry fertilizer into those containers, then you want to regularly fertilize with the liquid fertilizer in your watering can, doing that soil drench. And the reason why is because every time we water containers, uh, nutrients are gonna get leached out as the water drains through that container. So when we have uh, planter boxes, window boxes, hanging baskets, you know, the little cluster of pots with herbs on our deck or on our porch, or even this half barrel with this um, nectarine and lettuces, we want to fertilize a little bit more often than if it was just straight in the ground. Uh, citrus I can share are heavy feeders. Citrus are evergreen. Uh, it's an evergreen fruiting plant. And it takes a lot of energy for that citrus to create that the fruit. So um, during the growing season, again, I'm going to be fertilizing with my dry fertilizer, my citrus and fruit tree fertilizer about every month. You can skip and do about every other month. However, just keep in mind that citrus really likes to have its food. A good rule of thumb is we're going to look at the diameter of the trunk. If the trunk is two inches, we're going to apply two cups. So for every inch diameter, it's going to be a cup of that fertilizer. And we're going to work it into the drip line around the citrus. Now, the citrus, you might have a citrus that's 10 years old and is a, a beast, but scratch it in. Needless to say, just scratch it in around the drip line. Get that nice layer of mulch on top. And then make sure that you are doing a nice deep watering and then you're letting that soil dry out a good number of inches before it gets watered again. So check your irrigation. Um, and then through the growing season, I am also going to be applying a liquid fertilizer about once a month. So it's a dry fertilizer once a month, liquid fertilizer once a month. So it could be like every other week. And the growing season for citrus could easily be when just the temperatures get nicer. So I might, I mean, today is a beautiful day. I might go out and uh, do some fertilizing today on my citrus. Although we know we still are, can get another frost. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be mindful and I, I might take those uh, frost blankets off for a minute so they can get some nice warm sun, but I'm going to put those frost blankets back up because I think it might be cold. Just check your temperatures where you are. And I know slope gives out those good alerts. And then flowering shrubs. Flowering shrubs are uh, like camellias, uh, for instance, because we're they're in bloom right now. What I like to do is I like to feed my flowering shrubs or hydrangeas. 
uh, after they've bloomed. So after the bloom season is over, I'm going to fertilize that those plants because that's really um, when I'm thinking about them. And then that can be enough. You can just leave it at that. Or if you really can uh, be mindful, maybe mark your calendar about three or four months before that plant is uh, due to bloom, you can fertilize again. And you're going to use a bloom fertilizer or you can use an all purpose after they've bloomed and a bloom fertilizer that three or four months before they bloom. Okay. So the garden suggests there might be a place where we can meet nature halfway. And I hope you can achieve that with some fertilizer. So I really hope that um, you've learned some things this morning that uh, the program has offered you some support and guidance and that's clarified some questions that you've had, but uh, we're here to answer some more questions. Um, I hope that was nice and short and sweet for you all so that you can, um, I know we've got a beautiful day ahead of us. So let's answer some questions, Jen. Yeah, that was perfect. Oh my gosh, you way to present a bunch of information, uh, very, uh, succinct. So anyway, we do have some other good questions. Um, is it okay to fertilize at the same time as your dormant or disease spraying? Yes, absolutely. So if we're doing fruit trees, if we're pruning our fruit trees and then we're doing a dormant spray, we've cleaned up the debris around the bottom. I might go ahead and go uh, fertilize at that time. However, with my fruit trees, I will add, before the um, cold season really comes on, usually at the beginning, end of October, beginning of November, all of my fruit trees, be it deciduous or citrus, I am going to do a nice ring around the edge, that drip line with fertilizer, and then a layer of chicken manure, if you're open to chicken manure, or if you have good quality compost, so we're gonna do fertilizer, compost or chicken manure and then mulch on top. And then the winter comes in, we do our pruning and then that's when I fertilize again, as I mentioned. Great. Um, when you test your soil in your yard, how many areas do you need to test? Um, it depends. So when you reach out to one of those soil testing labs, they're going to give you very specific instructions. If you're kind of doing it yourself with one of those little kits, which um, is accurate-ish, uh, you're going to want to test as many areas as possible. But keeping in mind, if you're testing the northwest corner of your garden and you are going to be planting blueberries there, then you want to be mindful, is that soil, the nutrients there are going to be appropriate for the blueberries? Does that make sense? So it's kind of, uh, you want to just test an area with the intention of what you're going to be planting in that area, kind of. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I've heard that wood chips, when they decompose, they steal nitrogen from the soil. Is this true? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. It's a question that commonly comes up. When wood chips start to break down, they will, uh, quote unquote, kind of freeze up nitrogen, but just for a very brief period and not enough that's going to impact the plant, especially if you're also adding um, uh, fertilizer. So if we have fertilizer, if we have a really healthy uh, soil relationship where the soil health is at its peak, having some decomposing wood chips that locks up nitrogen briefly is not going to impact the um, relationship or the health of the plant. Okay, um, I use EB stone fertilizer. If I still have some left from last season, is it still good to use or do I need to buy a fresh bag? Great question. Use the fertilizer. Even if that bag of fertilizer was five years old, the back of the shed and kind of crusty, break it up and get it into the soil because the microbiology is still going to be able to decompose it and use what nutrients are left over. Might be a little stale, but it's better than, you know, getting rid of it any other way. 
Uh, how often should you fertilize containers with liquid fertilizers? Um, if they're uh, herbs or perennials, like flowers, I'm sorry. Um, if, it's a, if it's a perennial, then I would probably fertilize about once a month, maybe um, depending on the plant, if I feel like it needs a little bit more, maybe twice a month, but I, I'm, I'd probably do it about once a month, but if it's a annual, um, uh, such as the Icelandic poppies or lettuces or radishes, you know, you know, if it's got a one year life cycle or one season life cycle, then I might fertilize a little bit more frequently, maybe about every other week. Great. Yeah. And I usually, it depends on the fertilizer because sometimes they're not as strong some are not as strong, right? So you can fertilize every time you water or. Yeah. If you're diluting it some, you know, um, I like using the fish emulsion with kelp or the fish hydrolysate with kelp. I'm a big fan of fish and kelp and I will fertilize. Sometimes I just make it a little weaker and I'm fertilizing more often. Yeah. Um, several people are asking about the slides, and I just want to remind you that we will have the recording up on Sloat's website by Monday evening, and that's the best way to access the slides. And also, you do have the link to Suzanne's outline and resource handout. So um, just wanted to say that really quick, because we had a few questions on that. Uh, could you please explain, again, the drip line around the plant? Oh yeah, let's, should we go back to that slide? Sure. Would that be helpful for people? Let me see if I can do it this way. Hey, that was great. <laughs> so the drip line is going to be, let's just imagine, in fact, let's just go here. So I'm not sure if you guys, can you see, I'm not sure if everyone can see my cursor, but right above her head where her little bun is, is the outer edge to the left of the drip line of this pear tree. And on the other side, there looks like a green sweatshirt. On the very right edge of that, the outer line of the pear tree is to the very edge. That's the drip line. It's out here. So um, it's almost like the, um, the footprint, if you were to look at the tree from an aerial view, or the shrub or the perennial, like in this illustration. The drip line goes from where the outer canopy of the plant is directly down. So why it's called the drip line is because if you've ever been outside and um, you're on a hike and you're in like an oak forest or redwood forest and it starts to rain all of a sudden and you don't have your rain gear with you, you're gonna duck under a tree to protect yourself from the rain. The canopy of that tree is acting as an umbrella, but all around that tree, you're seeing that the rain is getting the soil wet. And over time, the rain is going to accumulate on the canopy of that tree like a roof and kind of schluff off the side and drop down and water the little root hairs that are around the canopy. That's the drip line. So think of it as like the roof of the house, that's the canopy. And that's where we want to focus our water when we irrigate and also our fertilizer or food when we feed the plants. Great. Um, thoughts about using sunken tubes to apply fertilizer or water? What do you, are, are you talking about um, like Spine, the, like the deep root irrigate, um, the deep root irrigation tools or spikes? Yeah. Spikes? I, I would assume spikes. I, that, that wasn't, um, it didn't say in the question. So what are my thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have a hedgerow of um, like myrtles or uh, pittosporum, and it's, it might be a lot easier for you just to um, apply spikes like the evergreen tree spikes or shrub spikes to that hedgerow 
than to go along and scratch in fertilizer. That's the only time I've really used the spikes as a professional gardener. I also know that some people really like to use the spikes for their fruit trees. Um, only recently have them been making spikes that are organic. And my preference is always using organic over synthetic. So that's something else to consider if you have a preference, if you can't find the organic spikes and you want to strictly feed organic, then maybe that's going to be the decision you make. Um, but other than that, it's really up to you. It's spikes can be a heck of a lot easier, but they're also more expensive. And you really wanna read the label and see what is the spacing and how often do you need to um, add them again? Great. Um, okay, a lot of good questions. Uh, I know you're doing a great job, Jen. It's I had to do questions one time and it was not easy. I know, well, cause I wanna pick the ones that majority of people are at, you know. I know. You're doing awesome. Um, uh, this is actually, this is, I think a good one that some people can apply to are some organic fertilizers less desirable to pets or dogs. Oh, My dogs yeah. go crazy for the bone meal types. It's true. Yeah. yeah. That is a great question. Thanks for asking that one. Yeah. The animals go crazy for the fertilizer, right? So what I like to do yet another reason why it's important to put that nice layer of mulch on top, because then the animals will not be as attracted. And if you've scratched it in well, but I can share that fish emulsion, boy, the raccoons it has a tendency to attract the raccoons. So that's why I like to do fertilizing early in the day or early in the morning. And hopefully by the end of the day, you know, that scent has kind of dissipated. But I would definitely encourage people for uh, uh, to keep the fertilizer contained in a bucket with a lid so the pets can't get into it. And then maybe just fence off that area or keep your pets away from that area if possible. If you notice you have a dog that's particularly frantic about digging after you've fertilized. Mm -hmm. Usually after about a day or two, that's not an issue any longer. Um, how do you know the, how do you know what ratio you want on the end for the NPK? Good what question. Different numbers. Well, I, I would have to say what drives my decision for fertilizer is the brand that I'm buying. Um, I know, uh, certain brands have certain ingredients or I should, let me back up. The ingredients in the organic fertilizer box is what's really driving my decision more than the numbers. And nowadays, uh, they make fertilizers for just about anything. They make an all purpose, they make one for um, vegetables, they make one for fruit trees, they make one for roses, they make one that's a bloom booster. When I started in the industry, we could only get the individual ingredients and we had to make our own blends. So is it, it kind of depends on what you're fertilizing. Again, is it something that prefers to have a little bit more of an acidic pH? Is it rhododendrons, azaleas, blueberries? Or is it just flowering and we really want to promote more flower bloom? And then from there, um, the next thing that drives my decision is, is it organic? And then are, is it going to be a good quality? Um, because when I know I'm getting a vegetable fertilizer that's organic and good quality, the NPK is not as crucial because I trust the company that created that fertilizer to, I, I trust their science. The chemistry gets really technical really fast. So I, I have to say that I typically am not as um, focused on the numbers when I'm getting something that's very specific for the, the plants I'm trying to feed. Great. Um, Sorry that that maybe didn't answer your question, but hopefully that offered you a little support and confidence that yeah, like citrus food, just get a citrus food, maybe not get so hung up on the numbers, things like that. 
Um, is black bark a problem? I know it's treated. Oh yeah, uh, black bark. So when we have mulches that are dyed, so um, they come in different color dyes like red um, and black are very common. Those are vegetable based dyes, so they're not toxic. They, uh, but a couple things to keep in mind that they can leach, that color can leach. So if you are putting it near a, a patio that has its porous uh, flagstone or concrete, understand that that can stain that uh, walkway or that patio, or uh, sadly in a situation where a woman used, um, this person used the red bark for her orchids and it turned her orchids red. So um, just be mindful that it can change the color of certain things. But then the black mulch I've recently heard is not as ideal because it also retains a lot of heat. It attracts heat. So. I haven't had that experience or I don't really know, um, but it's something that has come up a couple of times. So just be mindful of that. Yeah, I would say from a design perspective, the black mulch tends to fade pretty quick too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I prefer the uh, mini bark, the fur, the, the quarter inch mini bark tends to stay more vibrant. Um, okay, is there a time of day that's best to fertilize? Good question. Uh, I like to fertilize earlier in the day when things are still cool. And especially if, uh, then I can water. I always like to water after I fertilize. It's just something that you don't have to do. It's certainly not required. If I've, I, if I've applied the dry fertilizer and then I've put the mulch on top, I like to water. It just seems like a, it just feels really good to do. It's something that kind of uh, finishes the job almost to say. But then if I'm doing a liquid fertilizer, um, like I said, it's best to do when it's not super hot. So when we don't have excessive heat or frost within 24 hours. Um, so I like to use the liquid fertilizer during the cool part of the day. And so sometimes I'm doing it at the end of the day after I've done my gardening chores. So I've like done all my tasks and then that's kind of how I finish my day. Although, as I mentioned, that's at the end of the day, we're getting kind of pushing the limits and then we're going to start to attract skunks, raccoons, and possums. So if that's an issue, maybe focus that the next morning or, you know, earlier in the day. Should you be using liquid fertilizer during the winter? Ooh, good question. I would say probably only on your house plants. Um, the reason why is because, well, it depends where you live. So in San Francisco, we might be applying fertilizer through the winter. It really depends. When temperatures are cold or colder, when temperatures really cool off and the soil temperatures cool down, the plants are not actively growing as much. We see this all the time. We're not seeing a lot of new growth. We're not seeing a lot of things flower. Um, and we're, if you happen to have a lawn, we're not really mowing the lawn as often. Things really slow down. And because of that, we don't need to uh, fertilize with the liquid fertilizers as often. Although working with those dry fertilizers work in time with that slower kind of dormant growing season or the slower growing season. So I would say yes to dry fertilizers during the winter, but no to liquid fertilizers unless you feel that it's appropriate. Um, if you compost annually, is fertilizing still necessary? Great question, because I realize I didn't mention this earlier with the compost slide. So compost, if you know you are uh, making your own compost at home and you are loading it up with all the things it needs to have a nice, uh, diverse um, ingredient list that's going to invite a lot of uh, a very diverse um, microbiology um, assortment and it's of the highest quality and you did an excellent job, then it's going to be really fantastic and add a lot of nutrients to your soil and to your plants. And I can also say um, if you're doing any type of vermiculture, worm castings is also little, it's like little tablespoons of gold that you can add to the soil. So that will benefit your plants 
tremendously. However, at some point, we either are not able to add more volume to the soil, you know, because compost is a little bit of volume. And, and that, that's when we would need to use fertilizer as the food source. Or if we are um, perennials, perennials that are in the ground for a long time, and this could be perennial food like artichokes or asparagus or perennials in our garden, like the date, Shasta daisies and penstemon and stuff like that, we're going to want to feed them annually. And sometimes we can't really get enough compost into around that root zone. Now, if that was the case, if I had a lot of compost that I was making, I would do that same practice where I'm scratching in fertilizer and then I'm doing a nice thin layer of compost and getting mulch on top. And if we're buying compost from the stores, sometimes the compost at the stores, depending on, you know, you're kind of what you pay, you're, sometimes people think that uh, it's best just to get the least expensive compost. And that's not always ideal. It kind of depends on what you're, um, what you're going to be planting. So you kind of get what you pay for. So that's another reason why it's good to also add fertilizer when we're amending the soil with compost is just to add anything, um, add any more food that the compost maybe is lacking or to get that microbiology kind of alive and booming again. Great, uh, maybe just a couple more questions. Okay. Sure. Um, a lot of people are asking for their, their specific plant, you know, like when to fertilize lavender, when to fertilize geranium and whatnot. I mean, do you have, would you just say to um, look at the fertilizer box or how, you know, how, how will you know? Yeah. When to fertilize your sort of each individual plants. Yeah. So I fertilize when I plant something new. And then from there, um, for my established garden, I will do like today I'm going to get out there and do a big cleanup because I haven't really gotten to my um, late winter, early spring cleanup yet. And maybe in a couple more weeks is when I might do my big fertilize all the perennials in the garden where I'm scratching fertilizer in around the plants, doing a little thin layer of compost and then a little a nice layer of mulch on top. Uh, I might then at the same time before I finish with that, um, with the mulch, I might check irrigation and make sure it's working. And then I... I feel like I'm set with the dry fertilizer. And as things start to grow, as flowers start to bloom, as um, the food crops start to grow, I will go through and then do soil drench of liquid fertilizer. Now, geraniums, and I'm, I'm assuming it is the, um, the pelagonium as opposed to the true geranium. True geranium, I would put in a similar category as the lavender, but the pelagoniums, we are going to deadhead them and we really want them to bloom for the entire, almost the entire year. And typically those are in a container. So I might be adding liquid fertilizer more often. Uh, if it's in a, if they're planted in the ground, I will give them dry fertilizer at the same time I gave the lavender dry fertilizer. And then I might just go through and just kind of give them a little splash with the watering can of fertilizer when I'm fertilizing my roses. I don't know. I think you can kind of judge if something looks really good, then it's probably doing really well. And if you have a nice um, uh, routine, I mean, I try to get out there and fertilize like kind of once a month with my watering can, but I also grow a lot of food and I also have roses and the food and the roses both like a lot of fertilizer. All right, um, this is awesome, awesome information. One last question. Do you have a particular favorite organic fertilizers, both liquid or um, granular? Um, okay. I don't feel comfortable. Um, I'm not supposed to really have a biased opinion. <laughs> so, but I, and I'm friends with all of the fertilizing, uh, reps. So, uh, if you want to email me, I can tell you, but I, I, I have to share that 
organic is the way to go. And um, all the fertilizers that you're going to see out there, uh, the local ones, I would stay local. You know, um, there's a, you know, a couple companies that are very close by. Uh, I would take advantage of any vendor events when we get to be um, in public again with each other. I know Sloat uh, has their reps come regularly and do tablings as well as um, other businesses around the greater Bay Area. And I'd also invite you to give them a call or email them, look at their websites. You can get a lot of great information. And then um, you'll start to see who who you kind of like, which one kind of fits the profile that you prefer. Um, I will say that it's really, really important. I mean, I've got some favorites, but it's just be careful and make sure that um, you understand the ingredients in the fertilizer and that it's, and you're really reading the label and seeing if, you know, how often it should get applied and things. And, you know, I can also say less is more. I have a tendency to be kind of lazy in my own garden. I always give my clients way more attention than my own garden. And it's, I, sometimes I feel like, boy, it's survival of the fittest over at my place. But uh, when we feed regularly, we're able to uh, kind of keep the life forces going. And it's also, um, yeah, and, and uh, most of the fertilizers are very similar anyway. I get tons of free samples for them also, and I buy a lot of different brands, and sometimes I'm buying what's on sale. And I just know that there's there's a lot of similarities. So it's just kind of tough. So I'm sorry, but feel free to email me. And everybody else who has questions or if questions come up, don't hesitate just to email me. So, and it could take me a couple of days to reply, but I'll get I'll get back to you. Yeah, I agree. I, I like experimenting with different organic fertilizers too. I think it's kind of fun to not have a particular favorite, but just sort of do try different ones out. Um, I do want to tell everyone that Suzanne will be back on the 20th of March for an organic vegetable gardening class. And so um, obviously, I mean, great information and we'll, she'll be back to apply it specifically to a vegetable garden. So go and register for that class. It's on our website. Again, the recording will be available on our website by Tuesday morning at the latest, probably Monday evening. And you'll be able to see the slides in the recording. So you'll be able to sort of stop and start the slides um, and get that information through that. And then also the link for Suzanne's um, handouts was sent in the reminder email that you received about an hour before the class. If you didn't get that, um, if you just go to Sloat's website and you search fertilizer, it comes up the outlines come up. And Suzanne, I just want to say a big thanks again. I mean, great information. I always learn from you. Um, and I'm sure a lot, I mean, a lot of just in the Q and a people are saying, thanks so much. You're so and welcome. I think that, you know, you covered it great in a perfect amount of time. So, and now we all have time to go out on this beautiful Bay area day and, do a bunch of cleanup and fertilizing in our gardens. So yeah, what a better way to spend the day, you know, it's I know. great. I know. So yeah. thanks again. And thank you everyone for joining and if you have any questions. Feel free to follow up with Suzanne or myself and have a great weekend. Yeah. Take thanks care. everyone. Stay healthy.